fiction. Science fiction. Horror. Fantasy. Crime. LGBT. Thriller. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Dave Martino is back. I'm back. So what's going on with you? And so I, I guess you partied up for the Oscars. You're all there and you're oh, yeah. all done up. And you're and yeah. you just did you slap anyone this year? Not this year. <laughs> no, <laughs> not, not this year. I'm going to be doing the interview first on the show, of course. Uh, and after that, we're going to be doing the. Um, you have the movie review for the oh, yes. movie that won quite a few of the awards, eh? Coming up. That's right. So I'm excited to hear that. And That'd be cool. I'll probably still see it whether you liked it or not. <laughs> well, I don't blame you. You should. Yeah. Make up your own mind. Oh, no. I, I can't ever do that. <laughs> yeah. I, need, I need my assistance. I need my dogs <laughs> to make up my mind. That's right. Okay, so let's bring in let's bring in our, our guests today. We've got uh, pretty famous writers. I, I they've been selling like, God, what twenty five million copies of thirty thirty five books or so that they've done together. So um, must be like a married couple, you know. The book we're kind of focusing on today is the Cabinet of Doctor Ling, and it's um, Agent Pentagrass series book twenty one. So let's welcome uh, Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child. Thank you for being here. Well, it's good to be here. Thanks for having us. Well, guys, you know, of course, uh, you've never been on the show. So for our audience, and if the, if the ones that don't know you, which probably won't be too many, uh, that many books being sold, how did the two of you get into writing and writing together and doing it successfully. Like, where did that road start? Well, I'll, uh, that's a curious story. I worked at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, and I got a call one day from somebody who said they wanted me to write a book about the museum because I've been writing a column in the magazine. And, uh, and that person was Lincoln Child. He was an editor at St. Martin's Press. And so I wrote a book called Dinosaurs in the Attic. It was a nonfiction book. And it, Lincoln edited it. He did a wonderful job. And at a certain point, I gave Lincoln a tour of the museum. It was a very special tour because it took place at, at night after the museum was closed. I thought that'd be really cool. And uh, we ended up at midnight or 1 o'clock in the morning in the, one of the huge dinosaur halls. And it was really, you know, there was lightning uh, flickering in the clear stories and all the the lights were off except for emergency lighting. It was really a, a scary, giant room with these T-Rexes looming over us. And Lincoln turned to me and he said, Doug, this is the scariest damn building in the world. We have got to write a thriller <laughs> set in this building. And that's how we got started. It's funny because I'd edited, um, you know, hundreds of books wow. um, by that time for St. Martin's. And I had tried writing my own stuff in high school and college, and it never went anywhere. And when you're in publishing, it's an even greater incentive not to write because you see how many bad manuscripts are circling around. You know, I mean, everybody wants to write a book, and, you know, thank God they do. The creative uh, instinct is a wonderful thing, but not everybody has the training or ability to do it. And seeing so many books, you know, for every one, every hundred you see, you can probably publish one. It made my own interest in writing even more uh, problematic. But working with Doug, who was a was a a journalist uh, at the magazine at the museum, and you know, wrote as they say, you know, got paid by the word. I learned pretty quickly that how the uh, ideas of chapters that I gave him for our first book 
And of course, you have to understand, this was just a, a just a flyer on our part. We never thought we could publish. We just liked each other and had fun hanging out at my house in Westchester and, you know, drinking scotch and uh, thinking about how to write. Um, but as I gave him ideas for chapters, and I saw him put those chapters into, into words, my own nascent interest in writing um, reemerged. And so, you know, soon after, it took a few books, but we were both sharing the writing and the plotting equally. But it took some time because you have to realize, there are two things you have to realize. This was, this was like in the pre-Cambrian area. This was a long time ago. And um, we had to communicate by fax. There were no through internet. And also, there were no techno thrillers at the time, save, I guess, somebody like Michael Crichton, you know, rest his uh, soul. And also, nobody had heard of two people writing a book together. It was unheard of, to the point where in England, many of our early books were published as Lincoln Preston, because they were afraid nobody would buy them. Um, but how the hell do two people write a book together that's a fiction book? So we had that going against us early on, but we, we managed to overcome that. And, uh, um, and now techno thrillers are much more common, and um, it's not strange for us to be, you know, in fact, we've become Preston and Child, you know, like Johnson & Johnson or uh, Wells, Wells Fargo. Uh, well, we can only hope. All right, and I should mention that book that we were inspired to write, that first one was Relic, and that became uh, The Relic, uh, a movie from Paramount Pictures that was a number one box office hit. And uh, that was a big surprise to us because both of us were very impecunious writers. And I'll tell you, when that movie check arrived, that was a nice, that was a really nice check. <laughs> it was very encouraging to us to think that we were on the right track. So uh, it sounds to me like you're different, you were different types of writers when you were first doing Relic. And um, so I imagine you, you sort of learned off of each other's way. Like Lincoln, do you say that you you did you learned a lot from Doug Preston when you were doing this? Well, in the sense that I was mostly an editor, that was my job was to edit people's books, and I had written as a as a kid. You know, I'd written a terrible novel and lots of bad short stories, but that urge went away when I became an editor full time. Uh, it's like working in the candy store. You don't want to eat candy when you get home. You mess with it all day. And but Doug was a was a writer. You know, he'd written the book for me, a nonfiction book, and he was eager to write a mystery set in the in the museum because you know that National History Museum, any museum like that, is just is full of bones and curses and strange objects, and it's a great setting for a book. Um, but we were inspired to work together uh, on a thriller rather than a mystery. Um, because mysteries don't sell very well, and they're they're hard to do well. Um, and you know, Doug uh, did most of the writing. Um, I did a, the, a lot of the, and we would talk about the idea endlessly. And then I would I would sketch out chapters, and he would do most of the writing. And of course, he had his own career to worry about. So I had to part of my job was to keep him excited and interested in this when he had other things to do. Yes, I did learn a lot from Doug, um, from seeing how quickly he wrote and how well he wrote, and put the ideas that I had written in outline form of ours on paper. And I think he learned from the way I edited and rewrote his, his stuff. So right now, our work, after all these books, is a really a melange of our styles, and you know Doug and I both write solo novels too. Uh, I've written eight, and Doug's written uh, nearly that many, and he's written lots of nonfiction books. And I think we would both agree that our joint work is more than the sum of our parts. You know, like like a lot of bands, like the Beatles. Not that we're in their league, obviously, but you know what I mean. Absolutely. Well, Doug and Link, um, I'm just wondering, either one of you can answer this. Um, did you have a hard time getting Relic published because it was more of a multi-genre novel? It was a thriller. It has uh, some science fiction. It has horror. And by 95, I think, you know, the um, 
the, the horror uh, field or the, the industry itself had kind of um, imploded by that time. So uh, how, how, how difficult was it to get Relic published? Well, it, was, uh, it wasn't easy. It's very difficult to get any kind of novel published. Um, we had, Lincoln found us an agent. Now, I had an agent already. But I didn't want him to handle this novel because I was a little nervous about that. I mean, I, I mean, to be honest with you, I sort of looked on myself as a serious nonfiction author. And I was writing a book for Michael Corda, Simon <laughs> Schuster. I told this agent, you can show this manuscript for Relic to anybody except Michael Corda at Simon & Schuster. Well, what did he do? The first person he sent it to was Michael Corda. And so Corda called me up, and he said, I've got this manuscript sitting in front of me by a guy named Douglas Preston. Uh, that's not you, is it? <laughs> but Michael, <laughs> let me explain. He said, no, 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 no. I, want, I just want you to listen very carefully. And so I was listening on the phone, and I heard this loud thump, like a crash. And then he got back on the phone, and I said, what was that? He said, that was your manuscript entering the wastebasket. Get back to work on the book you're supposed to be writing for me and forget all about these brain-eating monsters in museums. <laughs> well, we didn't forget about it, and we did find a very good and excellent publisher in, in Tor Forge, Macmillan. This is an imprint of Macmillan. And they did a wonderful job of it. And it was, like I said, it was, it was not just a, made into a movie, but it also was a bestseller. It was our first bestseller. And, and working together... Um, what is your process like? Like, do you sit down and brainstorm ideas, or, or do you write certain characters while the other writes different characters? Like, what is what is your process of putting together a book like that? Start start with you, Doug. Well, it's um, you know when we were chatting earlier, you mentioned it was like a marriage. Uh, you know, a writing partnership. Our writing partnership is a bit like a marriage, a bad marriage, because we. We spend a lot of time sniping at each other and arguing and, and so forth. But, you know, that's part of the process. The way it works now is that we plot the books together, and then we each take a, a set of chapters to write, um, usually a thread. Like, I'll write a whole bunch of chapters from one character's point of view, and he'll write a whole bunch from another character's point of view. And then we swap the chapters and rewrite each other, and that's where things get difficult. That's where the sniping begins. Um, we had to agree not to use track changes and not to use document compare. We work using Dropbox without knowing what the other person has done. And so we don't get all hung up on, oh, you, you changed that beautiful word, or why did you change that this or that? We just, you know, work together, and we don't spend a lot of time uh, arguing about why things were changed. We just try to make the book as good as possible. But the, the reason it works is that I trust Link's judgment. When he, if he says to me, Doug, this chapter you've written is a pile of crap, I mean, I, I will get all pissed off. But he's right. I know he's right. He is a person with extraordinarily fine taste and judgment. And if he doesn't like something, I believe it. And the same is true, I hope, with him. Is that true, Link? When I tell you the something you've written is crap, you you believe me, or, or are you gonna are you gonna come over here and kill me? <laughs> no, I do believe you, and we are both fine fellows, and you you won't meet two more um, elegant or intelligent people than Doug and myself anywhere. Um, but that being said, it, it took us a while to reach that um, that arrangement. You know, it, it didn't happen overnight, and there were there were bumps along the way, uh, and you know it's funny. People often assume when they ask us the question you just asked, they assume that like Doug writes chapter one, and then I write chapter two, and we bounce it back and forth, and I see what he's done that inspires me to write the next chapter. But it doesn't work that way because that would actually be a recipe for, for failure because, you know, we need to each have our, our sort of our wheelhouse, so to speak. You know, I mean, I need a character or a plot sequence to work on. Otherwise, it would be so sequentially jarring and the reader would see right away that one of us had to drop 
everything and pick up where the where the other one left off. And let's say Doug wanted this guy named Hamlet to live to the end of the play, and I wanted to kill him off in Act Five. We have a real problem if he was headed in a different direction. We do to answer your question in in a very lengthy way. Uh, we we do trust each other's judgment, and that's the only way this kind of partnership would work. For all you aspiring joint novelists out there, um, you have to check your egos at the door. You have to respect your writing partner. Otherwise, better to do something else. Um, I will say, I will add, there are certain things which I think Doug quoted or will quote as, as little darlings. Is that right, Doug? Yeah, I think that was a line of Faulkner. Didn't he say that a good writer has to massacre his little darlings? Yeah, and I had heard that in college. You know, a professor told me when you're writing, find your favorite line and cut it out. And I thought, what the hell is he talking about? You know, it's my favorite line for a reason. But it's, it's true, and I'm not sure I can explain why. Maybe Doug can. But um, it's funny how Doug will zero in on a, on a line or a turn of phrase or a joke or something that I'm particularly pleased with. And we'll cut it out. You know, I, I take a certain sadistic pleasure in cutting, massacring Link's little darlings. But it, it, it is true. Writers, and we are no different than other writers, sometimes go too far. We go overboard. Our prose gets a little too purple. And I rein Link in, and he reins me in. Yeah. <laughs> and what we get is a pretty spare uh, prose. It's tough. It's spare. And our plots are really well constructed because if there's a dangling thread somewhere or not illogical thing, uh, Link is going to pick it up or I'll pick it up and we'll beat each other up over it. And uh, I think that that's one of the reasons why we've had 30 best selling novels in a row that we've written because our readers love the tight plots and the endings that really make sense. I mean, how many. Thrillers have you read where it's wonderful in the beginning, but then it comes to the end and it's just a big mess and all falls apart. Um, but we don't do that. Uh, if, we're, if we're working individually, that, that might happen. But we, together, uh, with our highly critical uh, you know, approach to each other, we make sure that those books are tight and really uh, a good read. And we've, we can speak with experience because we've both written solo books, so we know it from both sides of the fence. And, you know, when you're writing a solo book, of course, there are certain advantages. You can hold it up and say, hey, I wrote this, for better or worse. All the praise, not praise or criticism is, is on me. But, um, and you, but when, it's also a very lonely job. And when you get to a fork in the road, which is like every chapter, basically, you're not sure whether to go left or right. Should I spend more time with this character? Should I deepen this character? Should I fill this character off? Should I have them fall in love? You don't know. And and the fact is, if you make a mistake, you won't find out about it until you're like 50 folks down the road. And that's where having a writing partner looking over your shoulder who knows the whole story can say, wait a minute, you're going the wrong direction here, or... You better rein that in. You know, that's too much of that stuff, you know. Um, and it's true we have to split the money, um, but in other ways, it's more fun to write with uh, a partner you trust and you respect and that you have written, you know, countless books with than it is to try and sit and write on your own, which Doug manages to do by having an office outside of his house that he has to actually go to, like a nine-to-five job. And I have an office upstairs, and I have to force myself to go to it when I'm working on the solo book, because otherwise I would rather do the dishes or clean the house or, you know, kill roaches or anything, you know, <laughs> um, than write, because it's just it's very difficult. Well, I'm wondering, do you help each other with your solo works, or do you just totally... Um Focus on that individually. Well, I'll answer that question because that's a really good question. We do, in fact, help each other with our solo novels. Um, I will always read Link's solo novel and offer comments, and he will read mine. But we've even gone farther than that. Uh, on my solo novel, uh, Tyrannosaur Canyon, Link suggested the first chapter. And it was an awesome 
chapter. I mean, it was absolutely awesome, and it made that novel. He read the novel, and he said, wait, you need to do this in the first chapter. And then I read Lincoln's novel... Um, Deathmatch. Deathmatch. And I suggested the last chapter, and even uh, actually wrote a draft of it. And then he rewrote it, of course, and, and incorporated it. But we, we do help each other out. I mean, we're not, not just writing partners, but we're also close friends and intellectual uh, peers. And uh, we really enjoy working with each other. So, yes, we do read each other's and comment on each other's novels. That's great. Do you, do you guys kind of take ownership of certain characters throughout the, the series or the books? Like, you know, for instance, one one of you have... Um, one character that you write throughout, and it's kind of like your baby. Do you guys do that, or do, can you switch off on the same character? Well, we do do that. We do that, but um, we we're careful not to take it to extremes. You know, there are characters that Doug tends to write, um, and that I would rather he write, and there are characters that I tend to write, um, and I assume he would rather I do it. Um, because we both become more comfortable with, with those characters, and, and we fact is we like those characters a lot, so it's fun to write. But I'm interrupting here. Um, <laughs> Link says we like those characters a lot. Link has the hots for several of our people <laughs> here. I, I'm really shocked by this, but anyway, I just wanted to mention that. If you don't have the hots for them, that means that you did a bad job <laughs> writing them, because any normal person. Uh, a male would would have a, should have, should have the hobs for them because they're very attractive. But be that as it may, that we still don't allow each other to become so enamored of or have the hobs for or whatever you want to say about characters that we do not step in and say nope, she wouldn't do that or that's out of character or he wouldn't go that far, you know. And we we each write chapters from everybody's point of view. You know, I mean, for example, if I take a, a, a sequence where, say, Constance Green, one of the women that Doug referred to, has a is abducted by a kidnapper, let's say, I could write that whole sequence. But later on, Doug will write this this scene where somebody else comes in to save her, and of course, he has to write what Constance Green does and says um, in the, in that scene. Um, so we, even though yes, there are times that we have our own favorites, or 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 we have certain kinds of chapters that we tend to write. Doug writes a lot of the action scenes. I write a lot of the dialogue or description scenes. But you know, still at the at the at the end of the day, uh, we we rein each other in, and we we um, don't let our main characters, our biggest characters, become owned or, you know, favored by one of us, you know, we will we'll do that for other characters just because it's easier to write that way. But Agent Pendergast, for example, has always been both of ours. People ask us where he came from. We can't really tell you. Well, Doug can tell you how he, his original um, origins, but still, he developed through both of our efforts, and he's the main reason we've sold as many copies of books as we do have, Agent Pendergast is, in a lot of ways, the most unique hero of thrillers since Sherlock Holmes. And that may sound like bragging, but I, I think I find I have a lot of people to agree with us. Um, and so Doug and I have to share him because he's our golden goose. And I just wanted to, to add that to your comment about about character, quote-unquote, ownership. Well, who decided um, to, to go with Agent Pendergast or, let's say, Detective D'Acosta, who was in uh, both in Relic, who was like the main character? How Pendergast came about is a little bit of a mysterious thing. Um, I was writing the first chapters of Relic, and I had two cops. I had an Irish-American cop and an Italian-American cop. The Italian-American cop was D'Acosta. And I sent these chapters to Lincoln, and he he called me up, he said, oh, these are great chapters, but these two cops are the same character, really. Let's fold them both into the Augusta, and then let's come up with a unique detective, someone completely different. And by this point, I was really irritated with Lincoln, and I said very sarcastically, oh, 
Yeah, um, like you want like a albino from New Orleans. And Lincoln said, oh, oh, wait, I mean, maybe we can work with that. <laughs> and so we started talking about this character. Now, he's not albino, but he's just very pale. And I remember we said, oh, and he wears black suits. And when he is at the crime scene, he's often mistaken for the coroner. You know, he has a lugubrious aspect. And, and then as we talked in about 15 minutes, Pendergast was sort of standing in front of us, a fully formed character. And uh, as we then continued writing the novel, we each added more detail to this character. And I don't know what happened, but we did manage to create this absolutely unique character that uh, I don't know. We've you know, had 21 Pendergast books. And every single one of them has been a New York Times bestseller uh, in the top five. Um, our readers love him, and it's just a phenomenon. I, I, I'm kind of stunned by it, to be frank. Well, it's funny because as we had the conversation Doug described about him putting on a black suit, then I'm re reproducing the, uh, the conversation approximately, then I would say, yeah, let's have the suits tailored really nicely. And then Doug would say, yeah, let's have them wealthy. And I said, yeah, so that he, even though he's FBI, he can sort of he can take a dis dismissive attitude and be above the fray and all this stuff and make jokes, you know, m mordant jokes about what's going on. And Doug said, yeah, and then, but he's, since he's FBI, he's got a gun and he's got a lot of power and blah, blah, blah. And I said, and he can have a really witty you know, personality, so he makes fun of the, the blood spatter, he compares it to a Jackson Pollock painting, and Doug said, yeah, let's have him really cultured, you know, and and pretty soon we were dumping all the things we wanted to be, you know, or hoped to be um, into this guy and uh, shaping him, uh, and I think actually being shaped by him. You know, he created himself, but we created him. So, so what do you think comes first here? You know, is it is it the characters, the story, or the setting? And I guess when you're doing a series, of course, characters were probably the first, but I'm not sure. We're, well, first comes the contract, and then the money, and then <laughs> <laughs> sure, you know that's that's a that, that's a really good question. I know a lot of beginning authors, you know, face that. Should they start with the characters? Should they start with the settings? Should they start with the story? And it's almost like it's a synergistic wheel. Each informs the other. It's like a chicken and egg problem, except that there are more, more chickens and more eggs. So that the setting, you know, you, you can't just start with the setting and then pile everything into that. You can't just start with characters and expect them to do interesting things. And you can't just start with a plot and expect to populate it with settings and characters. It's, it's, you have to start with all three, and then you build slowly, each informing the other. And like, for example, Relic was set in the Museum of Natural History in New York, where I used to work. So we had a wonderful setting, but the plot, you know, we really struggled with the plot. We finally got that nailed down, and then that suggested more characters uh, the setting, and then the uh, the characters, the setting, and the plot all seem to sort of inform each other. And then we had the novel. And, uh, I mean, it worked. Some people think it's a weird question, but because we do a lot of fiction writers, uh, and we get a lot of, a large variety of answers on this question, and it's like, how do you experience your characters, your main characters, and, and how do you put together their let's say, their, their verbs, their verbiage, the way they speak to each other. How do you put together things? Do you see it like it's a, uh, a movie in your head? Do you have uh, characters talking to you, or is it nothing like that? That is a weird question. Uh, I will, I'll try and answer that, and then Doug can probably do a better job. But um, our characters, Doug and I used to, we don't have to as much anymore because we have such a huge cast, you know, it's, it's like we have a, a, a company, that a repertory company that does all sorts of plays and knows all the characters, but um, we would try and put together a character, you know, how he or she looks, how they talk, what their backstory is, what their, if they have any bete noirs or if they have any monkeys on their back, what those might be, 
if you want them to live or die at the end. Um, and then we try to make make them as realistic as possible. And and you know, as any I think almost any writer would do, we try and see things from their perspective, um, or as best we can. Um, so even even a villain, you know, you you have to make believable. And um, uh, if you want people to uh, think your story is credible, and that gets us in trouble sometimes because we get we get a lot of not a lot, but we get a fair number of emails saying, "I can't believe you dropped the f bomb in your book." You know that's terrible. I'm not going to buy any more of your books. And and I said, "Well, have you gone to any films recently? I mean, why is it all right for that word to be used a hundred times in a movie? Like, look at Die Hard. For, that was 25 years ago or so." And not in the book. And by the way, the character who's using it, if you notice, is not the librarian from Kansas. It's the bad guy who's using it. You know, he would use that word. It's, re it's realistic. But these are the same people who say, you, you killed off a dog in that last book of yours, and I'm not reading any more of your books because of that. And we would say to them, but that dog had to die to increase the suspense of what would happen to the dog's owner, who's the main character in the plot, and by the way, you didn't seem to mind the fact that he mowed down 50 hitmen three chapters earlier. You just mind this one animal being fictionally killed. So I now tell Doug that we should put in the copyright line of our books, no animals were harmed during the writing of this book. Well, we're both animal lovers. We, you know, we thrill the writers write about what disturbs them. And having a dog killed by a, a bad guy is very disturbing. And that's why we write about it. Um, but with regard to dialogue, you had mentioned dialogue. When I'm writing dialogue, and I think Lincoln is the same, you hear it in your head. You hear the character speaking in your head, in her voice or his voice, with their accent and everything else. So when Pendergast speaks, he has a very beautiful, honeyed, a, a New Orleans accent. That's a southern accent, but it's a very different southern accent than what you normally think of. You know, it's, it's smooth, it's like honey, it's like silk. It's a beautiful accent. That's how Pendergast speaks. And when I'm writing dialogue, I hear his voice in my head. It's amazing. It's like he's talking to me. He's taking medication for that, by the way, but it's not. <laughs> I was going to say, and you're not, you're not waking up in the middle of the night with finding a shovel in your head, you know, <laughs> muddy boots or something by the bed or anything like that, are you? Nothing. Head of a horse in my bed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, don't, you harmed an animal. I'm never reading an animal. No. We did not harm an animal, a character. That's right. Statistically, <laughs> not <laughs> No. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. No, I, 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 I have... Uh, three acres, and I have tons of dogs, and I'm always getting the old ones from the pound, so I'm animal lover myself. I can't read any of your books. No, just... <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in a recent review called our writing crisply, crisp and lightly ornate, and I like that a lot because um, uh, usually ornate and crisp don't go together, um, but... <laughs> um, you know, we, Doug and I were both huge fans of 19th century English literature, and um, we firmly believe that that uh, that you know there's no reason for those books to to die. They're not boring; they should still be read. Um, but nevertheless, even though we like to use you know la language like that where appropriate. You know, the, the last thing I do is I go over the manuscript and, like Ernest Hemingway, take out any excess verbiage that's there, shorten people's conversations, you know, um, take out any duplicated observations or anything just to make the book move faster. And I'm sure Doug does the same. And as well as correcting where necessary, and it's not often necessary, how people talk, you know, um, and that's just part of the writing process. And I think that's where the Christmas comes from. Right, right. With these books, and when you put them together and you complete it, 
and uh, the book gets out there, and, and uh, one of your fans picks it up and reads it. Um, of course, there's the mystery and the action and the story and all of that that goes in, into it. Is there a subtext or do you have a meaning that you hope people take away from a book? And it might have come organically. I'm not saying that it was a planned sort of statement in a book, but more something that just comes out of the way the story progressed that has a, a, a meaning you want people to get. Well, there are deeper themes and meanings in our books that, that people, you know, can take away with. I mean, about loyalty, about good and evil, um, about just, just, you know, larger themes, human themes that are, that are serious themes in our books. You know, it isn't just action and bang, bang and shoot, shoot them up kind of thing. Um, and, you know, our readers often tell us that. They say, you know, this character Pendergast has some really interesting ethical and moral uh, dimensions that are not typical. And it makes them think, um, you know, Pendergast, is a person of extremely high moral standards, but they might not be aligned with what you might consider to be church standards, if, if you know what I mean. It's uh, different. So yes, yes, definitely there, there's a moral universe in our books. It's a good moral universe, even if people are die and, they're, and there's great evil in it. And we hope people, you know, and, and our books affirm that moral universe. And also, we try and um, make sure that our books don't have any subtext that would irritate a political party or a religious party. You know, we're not pushing some kind of an agenda. I mean, last night I saw that film, Everything Everywhere All at Once, just to see what was so why it won so many awards. And I still don't know. I still don't know why it won so many awards. But one thing they said in that film was. <laughs> you know, about your feeling that something isn't quite right. You know, is something wrong in the universe right now? And I think if you ask a lot of people, I know, uh, speak, I'm speaking as an American, Democrats or Republicans, the one thing they would agree on is things aren't quite right. There's something that doesn't feel, you know, what, in a, but they have very different ideas of why that is. But in the same way as some, the majority of people might agree on that, the majority of people would like the same kind of a book. And, you know, so we're very careful to make our books interesting and, as Doug said, morally instructive and hopefully morally positive, but without any kind of an agenda that would offend somebody because, you know, we're not pushing. Um, we're pushing we're pushing entertainment of what we hope is a fairly high level, and we're not pushing anything else but that you will enjoy the book maybe learn something. We try and teach people in our books, you know, put them in new environments, new milieus, use long words, uh, use strange words. Um, people often thank us for doing that. Um, some people don't like it. And at the end of the day, that we just hope they like it enough so that they'll read another one. Is there something in particular, or what do you think each book that you complete together, what does it do for you? Like, what, how, how does it change you? Well, these are really interesting questions. Um, you know, f the first thing is that it's really fun to write these books. Lincoln and I have a great time writing these books. We have a wonderful time figuring out how things are going to work together, how things are going to happen. It's really enjoyable. I really love going, leaving my house and going to my office every day, and I'm incredibly grateful for that because I know that most people have jobs that they don't love, and I'm so grateful that I to have a job that I love doing. For me, personally, pleasure of writing these books is, is what I take away. Second, I feel like these characters are my friends, um, or some of them are my enemies, and I have outrage against them and <laughs> fury, you know. But they're, they're my friends, and even though they don't exist, some of these characters are more real to me than even some real people I know. And so... My life, I feel my life is populated with, with really interesting people and who do crazy things and surprise me and, and have wonderful intellect minds that, that see the world in different ways. I mean, actually I'm curious, Link, because that's a good question. How would you answer that question about our characters? And well, you know, 
as you were talking, I was I was thinking of a book about Lord of the Rings written years ago, and the author asked the rhetorical question, "Would I? Would you ever want to live in Middle Earth?" And he said, "I would in a flash." And I was thinking, I don't think I'd want to because they don't have TV or cars, but. We almost have a world, you know, we didn't intend to do this, but, but we started a few books in populating our world of, of the, of books with characters from other books that had nothing to do with the new book, just to bring them in out for the hell of it. And that led to creating like a multiverse, which now almost all of our characters in any book has, you know, one degree of separation from any other character. And so, when Doug said that he has other people in his in his life, I was thinking, without being you know a psychotic, I think yeah, I know I know what he means, and we haven't gone quite so far to create a world that I feel like I could live in and people I could I could talk to, but it's very close to that. The people we create are you know are we you know if we've done our job if we've made them really believable and fleshed out and. Typically, we're talking about Cabot and Dr. Lang here, and in that, for that particular book, when I finished that, personally, I, when I put that book down or closed that Word document, I felt a, a lot of, a hell of a lot of pride that we could pull off a book so complex with so many twists and turns that, and you know, readers, our readers are always had their antennae up to see as soon as they can, figure out what's going to happen. And I thought that we probably fooled them this time. And, you know, we, we created a world that's set in the past and the present, and it took so much work and so much research and effort and writing and rewriting and talking and arguing. But at the end of the day, I felt that book was a statement that Doug and I had, had put together, a statement of our of our our ethic, our intellect, our hard work, and just how much we cared about our readers. Because, you know, I thought nobody else, you know, there are authors who write one book and then write it again a hundred times. You know, we don't do that. And, you know, so I felt a great deal of pride thinking nobody can read this and not realize all the effort and love, really, that uh, went into creating this. Do you guys do a lot of social media activity, websites? Do you like fans and readers to interact with you? And if, if so, what is your website and what is your social media availability? Well, we do. We have a, um, a Facebook fan page, uh, Preston, Preston and Child on Facebook. And we, but most importantly, to communicate directly with our readers, we produce a newsletter that only goes out once a month, so we don't inundate our poor readers, and we give them something really fun, like a, a short story we've written for free, or an interview with Pendergast. And so once a month, we send out this newsletter, and we've got, uh, you know, 150,000 subscribers, and that's how we really communicate with our our fans, because we we get emails back from them. We can communicate with them directly. We're not going through the the filters and the algorithms of Facebook or Instagram. Or and, and neither one of us have a Twitter account, thank God. Uh, otherwise, we'd probably be in trouble. <laughs> um, so, so we go to our our and we have a website, Preston. You know, www.prestonchild.com. And if you go to that website, you can sign up for our newsletter, or you can poke around the website. We've got all kinds of fun things to read, including uh, one of the most popular parts of the website is our rogues gallery, where we have put, we, we copied and, and pasted some of the worst reviews our books have received. I mean, they are really, really bad reviews, and our readers really enjoy reading those reviews and then hearing our characters comment on the, <laughs> the review. So it's the review of the reviewers. We also enjoy seeing our readers in person. You know, for several years we couldn't do that because of the uh, uh, lockdown um, or whatever. But you know, uh, before that we were always out on tour, and since then, um, just in the last two months, Doug and I together toured seven or eight places in Florida, and then we were keynote speakers at the huge Savannah Book Festival, 
just a couple of weekends ago. And it was great to reconnect again in person with readers because, you know, it's a lonely business and you don't, like I said before, you don't really know, you know, what people are thinking and uh, until you until you see it in their faces and, and hear people who've either gotten tattoos of, you know, things in your books or, or name their kids that no, they haven't done that, <laughs> but, um, you know, and how, how, how great, how happy they are to see you and how far they've come to shake your hand. And it, it really is inspiring. And so we love our readers, not just because they buy our books, but also because they inspire us to write more. And we appreciate both the bad comments and the good because, you know, we need the criticism. And if we're getting swelled heads or if we're going in the wrong direction, you know, we, you know, we need to hear that. And not just from each other, but also from our readers. Right. Well, we really appreciate you being here. It's uh, been a thrill. It's been great to meet you. Of course, now your latest book, uh, it looks like it's The Cabinet of Dr. Ling, and it's Agent Pendergrast, series book 21. And, of course, uh, the authors are uh, Lincoln Child and Douglas Preston. And uh, they've got more pe- more people have their faces tattooed on their bodies than anyone. <laughs> so so just remember that. Anyway, well, thank you for being on the show, guys. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.